find the truth on this show, you will have to rely on your animal instincts. Beyond Belief. Fact or Fiction. Hosted by Jonathan Frakes. We live in a world where the real and the unreal live side by side, where substance is disguised as illusion, and the only explanations are unexplainable. Can you separate truth from fantasy? To do so, you must break through the web of your experience and open your mind to things beyond belief. The show you're about to see is centered around mysterious creatures, animals whose power to influence lives is both remarkable and unexplainable. What is truly behind the mysteries that animals seem to possess? Take this elephant. Even a simple question like, how many legs does it have, can be difficult to answer. You are about to see stories that will challenge your judgment. Are they fact or fiction? We'll tell you at the end of our show, but keep in mind that these stories have something in common with the legs of this elephant. There's nothing about them you can count on. The motorcycle has held a mystique for Americans since the 50s. Movies like The Wild One and Easy Rider have encouraged the image of the cyclist as the glamorous rebel of the open highway. And today, motorcycles have joined the ranks of classic cars as valuable examples of Americana. Greg Hansen never had much interest in motorcycles. He's much more into horses these days. But he's about to encounter a motorcycle that will change the roadmap of his entire life. The Barton Horse Ranch used to be a thriving showcase of championship thoroughbreds. My grandfather ran the ranch for 40 years with pride and tender love and care. A prolonged illness sidelined him and the ranch was neglected. Before he died, he was forced to sell off almost all of his horses, <laughs> except for his favorite, Nugget. Hey, Nugget. Thought you looked kind of lonely out here. Brought you a little surprise. Yeah. You miss Grandpa, don't you? Yeah, I do too. Boy, he sure left me with a mess here. I know he didn't mean to, but I don't know how I'm going to save this place. My grandfather left his ranch to me. So, if you have any ideas, yeah, you tell me. His dying wish was that I restore it to its former glory. My mother called me almost every day from her home in Los Angeles. She knew I was in a difficult spot, and she wanted to give me support. Well, uh, did you check with the bank about the loan? Yeah, and they turned me down. I'm not surprised. You know, I know it would break Grandpa's heart, but uh, I may have to sell the ranch. Oh, Greg. I'm so sorry. I know how much that ranch has always meant to you. You spent all those summers there as a little boy and had such a great time. Mom, I'm gonna have to call you back. No, oh, Nugget's out of the corral. I love you too. Bye. <sighs> Nugget! Nugget! All right, how'd you get the gate open? Where you at, boy? I sent an oncoming carrot embargo. Nugget! <sighs> I'm playing hide and seek with a horse. I need to get a life. Nugget, what are you doing back here? If you're looking for company, I am it. Wow. This place could use some work. I might have missed it altogether if it hadn't been for Nugget. I couldn't believe my eyes. A Harley Davidson motorcycle. Where did it come from? I didn't remember my grandfather ever owning one. How long had it been there? Nugget. This is weird. I thought it might be fun to ride around the ranch, but I needed money a lot more than I needed fun. Well. Yes, we should sell it. Think we should fix it up? I called the local motorcycle shop and spoke with the owner, Danny Gaines, about getting parts for the old bike. 
gave him the serial number and Gaines told me that he'd call back as soon as he found the parts. I thought that if I could clean up that bike and get it running, I might be able to sell it and use the money to pay off some of the bills. I didn't have to wait long for Danny Gaines to call back. Hello, Greg. It's Danny. Danny Gaines over here at Danny's Hog Heaven. Oh, hi, that was quick. So do you have the parts? Well, see, the thing is, I couldn't get those exact parts. So, um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that whole bike off your hands for 1500 bucks. 1500 bucks. It's a junker. You know, come on. It's got to be worth at least three. 1750 I wasn't prepared to give up the Harley that quickly. I wasn't sure what it was worth, but I thought that $1,500 might be a little low. Gaines continued to up the ante until he hit $10,000, his final offer, he said, but something didn't feel right. Um, look, I think I want to think about it for a while. Yeah. I called my mother and told her about the motorcycle and the $10,000 offer. That is so strange. And, and Nugget led you to it? Oh. Uh, why don't you hold off for a while? Remember that biker I rode cross country with? <laughs> yeah. Well, he owns a motorcycle shop. So if you'll give me that serial number, I'll run it by him. Five, three. Oh, uh, I don't have a pencil. Wait, wait, uh, wait. My mom's friend at the Valley Bike Shop checked out the serial number of the Harley. Later that same day, she received a very interesting conference call. A team of attorneys representing talk show host Jay Leno was interested in purchasing the vintage motorcycle. The next day, I received a personal visit from somebody who never dropped by the ranch before, not in all the time he lived nearby. This was getting real interesting. Greg? Danny? Danny Gaines. Hey. How are ya? Boy, this is a hard place to mine, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I wasn't expecting you. It's hard to barge in on you, but this couldn't wait. So this is a bike, huh? Yep. It's in worse shape than I thought. Look, I'm gonna be real honest with you. I got somebody interested in this old hog. I got him up to $15,000. That's about as high as he's gonna go. But it's a take it or leave it deal. And he needs to know right now. So here's the check. $15,000. Yeah. Well, if I were you, I'd grab it while the grabbing's good. Hey, hey, easy boy, easy, you all right? What's wrong? Yeah, probably something spooked her. Anyway, uh, hold up, I gotta get the phone. Hold on, wait a second. Why don't you just take the check and then I'll just wheel this bike on out of here. Just hold on a second, I'll be right back, okay? If Nugget hadn't interrupted, I might have taken that check, but I'm sure glad I didn't. Hello? Oh, hi, Mom. Uh, you haven't sold that Harley yet, have you? No, I didn't sell it yet. Why, you got an offer? Sure do. Are you sitting down? Two million dollars? Take it! <laughs> I already did! Wait, why would somebody pay that much money for this motorcycle? Oh. They told me to tell you, be sure and look under the seat. Okay, thanks, Mom. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> look under the seat. So what do you say, Bubba? Uh, no thanks, I got a better offer. To Priscilla, love Elvis. <laughs> Legend has it that Elvis gave Priscilla a motorcycle that has disappeared over the years. Never to be recovered until now. That is, if our story is really true. But did this story really happen? If so, how did the motorcycle mysteriously appear on Greg Hansen's property? And what stroke of fate allowed his horse to keep him from closing the deal at a lower price? Is this story of the legendary lost Harley the truth? Or are we just recycling another lie? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show, but coming up next. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that dog. Every time he howls, somebody in this building dies. We're not saying that he's a cause of it. We just want him out of here. 
When we return, the howling of a dog is the premonition of death on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. If the average dog is man's best friend, then what accolades does a seeing eye dog deserve? These invaluable animals provide the eyes for those who cannot see. Within their staunch hearts lie the power to protect and guide their owners from harm. But the dog in our next story seems to possess another kind of power, and protection from harm is nowhere in sight. Lloyd Weeks has been blind since birth. The most important thing in Lloyd's life is his dog, Buff. Not only are they close friends, but Buff has been his eyes for the past eight years. Hey, hey, Lloyd, what's up? <laughs> You're finally getting some painting done. Yeah, how do you know that? Hey, I may be blind, man, but I can still smell paint. <laughs> Can you smell what color it is? Of course, whatever's on sale. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Buff, how you doing, baby? Huh? He's the best. I don't know what I would do without him. Everyone in the building was fond of Lloyd and Buff until late one evening when the howling started. I'm getting a lot of complaints. You, you, you're gonna have to keep Buff quiet. My husband and I can't sleep with that dog howling like that. I know, I know, and I'm very sorry, but I don't know what's gotten into him. <laughs> See, he seems to be okay now. Something must have spooked him, because this never happened before. All right, all right Lloyd, all right. Good night. Just keep him quiet, will you? Good night, Rick. Early the next morning, Rick made a horrifying discovery. During the night, the tenant in apartment 1B hanged himself in his bathroom. The coroner's office estimated the time of death as around midnight, exactly one hour after Lloyd's dog stopped howling. Five days later, Buff howled again, and another tenant died. For the next two weeks, the building was quiet, and then the howling started again. Rick! Rick, you gotta help me! It's Roy. I think it's his heart. Rick tried to revive Roy, but it was hopeless. He died of a massive heart attack, exactly one hour after the howling had stopped. I'm telling you, there's something wrong with that dog. Every time he howls, somebody in this building dies. We're not saying that he's a cause of it. We just want him out of here. Lloyd would never let Buff go. The dog is his eyes. Would you give up your eyes? There's something wrong here. People are dying. If Lloyd won't get rid of that dog, then Lloyd goes too. But he's blind. I can't evict a blind man. Then we're all even, ain't that right? Yeah. yeah. Look, the dog hasn't howled for a week. Why don't we give him one more chance? Maybe whatever it was, it's over. And what if it isn't over? Who's gonna die next time? You? Me? Her? Him? It? Which one of us? I'm truly sorry about all of this, but you won't have to worry about Buff and I anymore, because we're moving out. The day Lloyd moved out, Rick felt guilt and anger at himself. But before Lloyd was out the door, Rick would feel terror. Bill, I feel really bad about this. Where are you going to go? Yeah, well, Buff and I are going to visit my sister. She's always wanted me to come. 
Now's the time. What about the puzzle? Well, you keep it. Because I'm coming back here one day, and uh, we're going to finish that thing together. OK? Look, here's my card. Call me if you need anything. Oh, buddy, you're not going to start that again, are you? Rick couldn't help what he was feeling. It's going to be all right. Maybe Rick would be the next to die. I know. I love you, too. It's going to be all right. Rick was relieved to see Lloyd go. The last howling had frightened him. Hopefully the lottery of death was over, yet he couldn't lose the fear he felt inside. The following day, two police officers came to Rick's building. They informed him that a man was killed by a runaway truck. Rick's card was found in his pocket. He went down to the morgue and identified the body of Lloyd Weeks. It broke his heart. Lloyd and his dog Buff died exactly one hour after the howling stopped. And now it was clear who the final howling was meant for. Lloyd Weeks and his dog Buff. Did the dog's bark really signify oncoming death? Was Buff some kind of angel of death foretelling doom? Or was it mere coincidence that all those people died? And what about the death of Lloyd and Buff? How ironic that a blind man and his seeing eye dog would die in this way. Why didn't Buff lead Lloyd to safety? Perhaps once Buff's bark foretold their oncoming doom, he was absolutely powerless to prevent it. What's your opinion? Are we telling you a true story of real substance, or are we just barking at the moon? <laughs> tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show, but coming up next. No, I plan on having me some venison for dinner. <laughs> I don't know. Trouble is, all that game's on that reservation land. You can't hunt there. That's who? What are you up to? I'm going where the deer and the antelope play! <laughs> when we return, two hunters enter a world of terror and fear on Beyond Belief fact or fiction. Would you display this as a trophy? Many hunters do. And without getting into a debate on the pros and cons of hunting, there is one thing we can all agree upon. The rules must be followed. When a hunter goes too far to satisfy his own bloodlust, then some line between nature and humanity is violated. Judd Fuller has no use for animals. He only wants them to satisfy his gross appetites. Before this day is through, he will learn every living thing comes with something you can never digest, the soul. Judd and I had spent the last two days trying to bag ourselves a six-point buck with our new high-powered hunting bows. We had no luck, and we were going home empty-handed. Say we just pack it in. Think of you next week. No, uh, uh, no, I'm not gonna be giving up that easy. That's what you said last week. We didn't buy these bows here to impress the tree. Uh, uh. No, I plan on having me some venison for dinner. <laughs> I don't know. Trouble is, all that game's on that reservation land. Can't hunt there. Says who? What are you up to? I'm going where the deer and the antelope play. <laughs> Judd, we're making a big mistake. We're not supposed to be in here. This is Indian land. This is sanctified ground. I know, you already told me that. Okay, okay, I'm just, just telling you, I've heard some weird stories about this place. Some but, peculiar things have happened up here. Would you just shut up? You're gonna scare all the deer away. I ain't the one yelling. Oh man, don't do that. Too late, I already did. Judd and I continued to wander deeper and deeper into the forest. Judd, wait a minute. Somebody's watching us. Nobody's watching us. There's nobody around here but us. Would you just give me a break? 
Sorry. Just got a weird feeling. Wait a minute. Did you hear that? Yeah, it's some big rig rolling down the hills there somewhere. No. Sounds like a drum. Drums, yeah. Right. This is the last time that I go hunting with you. You are a pain in the butt. Oh, mama, I got me a buck. I don't think so, Judd. He's, he's not very big. He's big enough. One shot, right through the heart. Ha! Ha! I got him! You missed him. No, I didn't. I got him! No, come on, John. You missed him. Come on, let's go back. I, I did not miss him. He's up there, laying up there somewhere. Now, you hear that? Those are drums. Yeah, they're drums. So what? So what? Is, so who the hell's playing them? I don't know, and I don't care. But I got my dude. He's laying up there dead somewhere, and I'm going to get him. All right, so you got it. We're going back. We're going back. Let's go back. Late in the afternoon, the time that we got back to our truck, I was relieved to get out of the reservation forest and away from the drums. Judd was still talking about the buck that got away. I'm coming back here tomorrow. I'm gonna find my buck and I'm gonna get me another one. And you ain't coming. I don't wanna come. I don't want part of that place. I don't know what you're so afraid of. I mean, it was just some kids playing around with some old oil drum or something. Would you look over there? That looks like your buck. That is not my buck. I killed my buck. I'm gonna kill this one too. Hey, he's getting away. No! no! the accident just wanted you to know he wasn't killed by your truck he was killed by an arrow what it's an old indian arrow not one of yours old indian arrow yeah come on i'll show you i don't get it that deer was laying right here dead as a post the trooper led me to where the deer had fallen the deer was gone. The arrow in his side was an artifact from an early Indian tribe, the same tribe whose property we had trespassed on. What happened here? Was Judd's death an ironic coincidence or revenge executed by the Indian spirits? Maybe the deer who blocked the truck was just wounded by someone in the immediate area. If so, then why were no other hunters found nearby? And how do you explain the presence of the Indian arrow? Have you already decided whether this story is fact or fiction? Or are you still hunting for the truth? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show, but coming up next. How could you? Truly, you gotta understand, these pictures are very important to me. My grandfather was right about you. Your heart is not pure. When we return, a young man has to face the threat of a deadly tribal legend on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. Almost every culture has some object that's supposed to ward off evil spirits. From gold amulets, to the decorated spears of the medicine man, to a simple rabbit's foot. Man has a basic need to protect himself from the unknown. And it can be a major mistake not to take the fears and superstitions of another culture seriously. Jason Reed came to the native village to study their primitive society. For now, love is in the air. But soon the air will be filled with the sounds of primal screams.
American graduate student Jason Reed has been living with the Bentu tribe deep in the lush rainforests of Brazil for the past two months. He's writing his master's thesis on the behavioral and cultural traditions of the primitive tribe. The Bentu people's chieftain has allowed the young American access with certain restrictions that he must honor. It's finished. That's great. What do you use it for? It's called a dream catcher. And the elders of my tribe use it for guidance and understanding. I can catch your dreams with it and find out many things about you. All you'll find out is that I dream about you every night. Please, Jason, don't say those things. My grandfather would never approve of our love. Why? Because he's a chief, you're a princess, and just a common American? It is the tradition of our tribe. You know how sick he's been. I don't want to upset him. What he doesn't know won't upset him. broken our trust. You say you come here to study, but you are only interested in my granddaughter. She's just helping me understand your ways, that's all it is. There's nothing else going on, I swear. I see no love in your heart for Trula. I warn you, stay away. Hey, no problem. I'm just here to do my research, then I'll leave. I have great respect for you, Chief Yuka. Jason did not heed the warning of the great chief and continued his pursuit of the beautiful young princess. Within the week, the chief's illness became worse and he died with his loving granddaughter by his side. What had started as a summer romance now took on greater significance for the princess, for she knew her grandfather had died with anger in his heart. sorry about your grandfather. He was a great man. Yes, he was. I loved him very much. So now what happens? I'm just curious. There is a sacred ceremony where my grandfather's spirit will leave his body and enter a crow, which then takes flight. No one is allowed in the hut until his spirit has been released. Wow, I'd love to get some pictures of that. You're not listening to me. Such an act would show great disrespect for my people and my grandfather. You're right, I, I didn't mean to be disrespectful. I would never do anything like that. Don't. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. It's not the right time, I understand. In the tradition of the Bentu, the chief was laid out in state. He was dressed in ceremonial robes made from the feathers of birds, including those from the most sacred of all, the crow. The next day before the ceremony started, Jason allowed ambition to win out over honor. He disobeyed the ancient funeral custom for his own selfish gain. How could you? Truly, you gotta understand, these pictures are very important to me. My grandfather was right about you. Your heart is not pure. Trula, wait! Trula! Trula, wait!
tribal laws of the Bentu tribe, it is written that outsiders must never be allowed to interfere with the rights and customs of the tribe. Punishment for this offense will be swift and sure, and the trees will echo with the sound of justice. The soul of the offender may redeem itself in the future world. These laws are kept in the holiest of sanctuaries in a secluded part of the forest located under the sign of the crow. So Jason Reed pays the ultimate price for superiority, for failing to heed the warnings all around him. But was it really the crow that killed him, or knowing the legend? Did he imagine that he was being stalked by a deadly enemy? Perhaps the bird was only as powerful as Jason's own imagination. Is this story an admirable retelling of an actual event? Or is it really nothing to crow about? We'll tell you whether this story is true or false at the end of our show, but next. Lucky Gene Avery had been running a crooked poker game out of the Deadwood Saloon for the past six months. When we return, a crooked card game is visited by a mysterious stranger on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. There's so many expressions in our everyday life taken from the game of cards, poker face, the Joker's wild, ace up your sleeve, just to name a few. It's because a game of cards reflects life itself. They're winners and losers, skill combined with luck. The boys in the Deadwood Saloon loved a good card game. In fact, there's another card phrase that describes them perfectly. Low down, no good, double dealing liars. Lucky Gene Avery had been running a crooked poker game out of the Deadwood Saloon for the past six months. Jimmy, bets to you. All right, I'll uh, go for it. Wally Pratt, a middle-aged salesman, was Lucky's latest pigeon. And me and my buddy Carl played along, so we had a full table. How many cards, Bob? Two. Well, I'm gonna call that 500 and raise it 3,000. Lucky had us trained to pick up our cues. Too rich for my blood. Me too. Poor Wally. <laughs> he never could figure out how Lucky could beat him every time. Now, Wally was already in for more than he could afford, but he didn't want to fold. Besides, he, uh, he had a good hand. <laughs> we could all see it in the mirror behind him. You're about to see what made Lucky so lucky. You could almost cut the tension with a knife. Me and my buddy Carl had a side bet on how long it would take to clean Wally out. I had under an hour, and it was going on 59 minutes. I'll call your raise. But I don't have the cash. This watch is worth at least $3,000. My wife gave it to me for our anniversary. Throw it in. This cowboy, full house. <laughs> Whoa, Wally. Whoa, better put on the brakes there. Seems that my house is fuller than your house. 59 minutes and 42 seconds. I won the bet. <laughs> sense trouble, so I motioned for Carl to join me at the table. Something's wrong here. I drop by each week for a friendly game of poker, and each week I'd lose, big time. No matter how good my hand is. You accusing me of cheating, Wally? It's so intense inside the saloon, we forget there's a whole modern world going on outside. Man, his wife 
wife's gonna give him hell when he shows up at home without that watch. Oh, who cares? Just so long as he shows up next week so we can take him again. Uh, he ain't gonna come back. Oh, he'll be back. Losers always come back because they think they can win. <laughs> it was June 3rd, 1997, a week since we tossed Wally out, and he still hadn't come back. Lucky even put on his Hawaiian shirt just to change his luck. <laughs> None of the locals would play with him. They didn't want to get cheated out of their money. Then one day, the old man and that dog came in looking for some action. And we was open for business. Anybody here interested in a friendly game of poker? You're gonna need some money for that, old man. This would be enough? Looks like plenty. Have a seat. Oh man, sure does look familiar. You seem to be able to place him, though. He just looks like another mark to me. Right from the beginning, things started going bad. First of all, the old man had the confidence of a winner. <laughs> and then there was that dog sitting there with his eyes fixed on Lucky, almost like he was daring him to cheat. <laughs> And then we saw Lucky lose a hand. Now that's something nobody had ever seen before. Lucky was actually starting to sweat. It was bad enough trying to stare down the old man, but that dog looked right through you. It seemed sort of like the dog was reading Lucky's mind and sending a telepathic message to the old man. All I know is the old man was playing fair and square, and he was cleaning Lucky's clock. Seven, eight, nine, ten. All diamonds. You could tell Lucky wanted to go under the table for his Lucky cards. But the old man was watching real close, and what the old man didn't catch, the dang dog did. Must have been a police dog or something. <laughs> For the rest of the afternoon, Lucky did nothing but lose. All the while, he continued to have trouble breathing. He complained that it felt like uh, something was tightening around his neck. Something that felt an awful lot like a noose. You're the loser, Lucky. Catch you cheating again. And I'm not gonna be so easy on you. Who was that guy? I'm telling you, I've seen that old man somewhere before. But where? The answer was right there on the wall, a picture taken in 1902 of the late Roy Bean, the hanging judge. Now, he'd been dead for years, but that old man sure looked like him, and it was definitely the same dang dog. What happened here? Could this really have been Judge Roy Bean, or just someone who looked like him? How do you explain the gold watch in the photo? Was it always in the picture? Why hadn't anyone noticed it before? Are we giving you a straight deal here? Or do you think we're really bluffing? Coming up, we'll find out which of our stories tonight were fact and which were fiction when Beyond Belief returns. Let's look at our stories and see which are fact and which are fiction. How about the story of the Elvis motorcycle that Jay Leno paid millions for? True or false? They told me to tell you, be sure and look under the seat. Okay, thanks, Mom. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> look under the seat. So what do you say, Bubba? Uh, no thanks, I got a better offer. To Priscilla. 
love Elvis. Although this story has been spread as true, it never happened. It's false. What about the story of the blind man's dog and his bark of doom? I know. I love you too. It's gonna be all right. Did we base our story of the foreboding dog on an actual event? Yes, it happened. According to first-hand interviews conducted by author Robert Trelins. Let's take a look at the story of the hunter who turns out to be prey. Well, would you look over there? That looks like your buck. That is not my buck. I killed my buck. I'm gonna kill this one too. Hey, he's getting away! Just no! Was this story of vengeance in the forest based on a real event? Not this time. It never happened. What about the story of the young man who refused to take the native curse seriously? Did the legend of the crow really take place? Not a chance. We made it up. Now let's turn to the story of the card cheats and the player that taught them a lesson. You're the loser, Lucky. Catch you cheating again. And I'm not gonna be so easy on you. Did a story about a card game similar to this one actually happen? Yes, it did. So, how did you do with all of our stories of mysterious animals? Were you able to tell the difference between fact or fiction? Or were we able to prove that in both the human world and the animal kingdom, things can often appear Beyond Belief. I'm Jonathan Frakes. Join us for more stories on Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction.